There we go. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to be back here again. <clears throat> Today's topic is one that I actually uh, I've always played with. I've always wanted to talk about, and I've actually never put together uh, a lecture uh, on it before. And that is, I guess it's two part. Number one, um, what is what is religion? Like we have structured religions all over the world from ancient classical times. We can go to Mesopotamia and look at their gods and goddesses. You can go to Greece and see uh, Zeus, Hera, Athena, go to Rome. And yet you know, with all of these established religions, you always have um, almost a frustration within the people who are practicing this, this structured religion. And almost inevitably, they end up creating an, uh, a, a, I guess you'd call it another type of, of uh, inter-religion inter-mysticism, inter-spirituality, something that's looking for something else that they're not getting they're not getting from the established religion. And this duality has always fascinated me. I've, I've, uh, and, and inevitably, these, this, this, uh, this, in, this search for an, inter not an intermediary, but something else, something that, um, that, will, that is nourishing for people, to their soul. Something that gives meaning to uh, the structure, the ritual, and the liturgy that's been following, and um, and that's 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 one aspect I want to explore with you today, and uh, and I hope we're gonna we're gonna look at a few clues. Once again, I'm convinced that in terms of our own Jewishness, that our own our own uh, answers towards mysticism uh, grew together with the Islamic search, and we're gonna look at that together today. But then again, I was also wondering that along with uh, with these mis these search and yearning for something else, for something more, something deeper, something more divine, something greater, something that 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 somehow allows you a closer connection with something else, some uh, some some kind of greater force, not to be too Star Warsy, and uh, and also uh, and inevitably we also get leaders that come along that that espouse different types of ideas. And these types of leaders attract followers, and and th and those followers uh, will sometimes gain comfort from the words, the practices, the ideas. And my and then I looked and then I and then I was saying, okay, we have these are messiahs, mashiachs, and I and I've and we've always yearned as Jews for a messiah. So of other cultures. <clears throat> so that's those are my and I said, can I weave those two together? I wasn't sure. So this is uh, you guys will tell me at the end if we've uh, if we've done it or not, but. Without further ado, let's start. And as you know, I never start a lecture without introducing you to some Arabic. This is a must. And uh, this is a very beautiful quote from a very famous Sufi poet by the name of Rumi. And we're gonna try this together. Uh, I'm gonna look at, the, look at the transliteration. And I want you to, uh, to actually mouth, first of all, let's look at the Arabic, the transliteration, Iksir. Iksir means break. Kalb is heart. Kalbak, your heart. Miragan, <clears throat> uh, like uh, keep breaking it. Hata until yuftaha, uh, from the cognate poter, yuftaha, until it opens. So you have to, one has to keep breaking one's heart over and over and over again until it opens. So let's, uh, let's try it together because I won't let you, I won't continue with the lecture until we do. So let's go. Because you have to speak Arabic, at least this much. Iksir, Kalbak, Miraran, Hata, Yuftaha. Again, Iksir, Kalbak, Miraran, Hata, Yuftaha. Are you trying it? Very good. Do I want to open the sound or we'll let it go for today, Shira? I think with 140 people, uh, okay. will we'll be echoed uh, in that way. So, Very good. Uh, so you'll write it in the chat for everybody so they can practice it. Okay, here we go. So I'll move to the next one then. Here we go. And of course, I hope this makes sense in terms of mysticism, in terms of yearning for something greater. And when you yearn for something more and something, something, uh, something aside from the ordinary, it, it can be painful. 
So the title of the lecture is Tr uh, Mysticism, Troubled Times, and Their Messiahs. So I started off, um, I guess I would say arbitrarily enough, by choosing a, an actual Christian uh, scene from a, a woman by the name of Hildegard, uh, who in the 1100s became an, uh, was, an, was an abbess of a monastery in Germany. And she was a polymath. She was famous for her, uh, her knowledge of botany, of medicine, of poetry, of music. We have an incredible corpus of her material, of her, uh, of her writings, of her songs. And, this, and she was also a mystic. And this, this uh, depiction about an actual illuminated manuscript that she supervised shows her, shows the divine flames reaching into her. And oh, so I wrote a little bit now. So I wrote, uh, yeah, she also created her own language known as lingua ignota. So obviously it's not surprising why I love her. And here's another one of uh, another one from her own manuscript of her writing uh, while she's receiving some kind of divine message. And in addition to being incredibly productive, in addition to being incredibly, so she wasn't just some hippie person just sitting there, uh, you know, like trying, you know, trying to be one with the universe and not doing much. She was very productive. She did a lot. And yet she also yearned for this ecstasy, for something closer, for something, a, a deeper relationship with something divine. And this is, and she had, and she had visions. And this is one of the, I wanted to read this to you. Uh, one moment. <clears throat> this, this is Hildegard's words. From my early childhood, before my bones, nerves, and veins were fully strengthened, I have always seen this vision in my soul, even to the present time when I am more than 70 years old. In this vision, my soul, as God would have it, rises up high into the vault of heaven and into the changing sky and spreads itself out among different people, although they are far away from me in distant lands and places. And because I see them in this way, in my soul, I observe them in accord with the shifting of clouds and other created things. I do not hear them with my outward ears, nor do I perceive them by the thoughts of my own heart or by any combination of my five senses, but in my soul alone, while my outward eyes are open. So I have never fallen prey to ecstasy in these visions, but I see them wide awake day and night. And I am constantly fettered by sickness and often in the grip of pain, so intense that it threatens to kill me. But God has sustained me until now. The light which I see is not spatial, but it is far, far brighter than a cloud which carries the sun. I can measure neither height nor length nor breadth in it, and I call it the reflection of the living light. And as the sun, the moon, and the stars appear in water, so writings, sermons, virtues, and certain human actions take form for me and gleam. I just wanted you to have these words because I think they're, uh, I think they actually give a lot of, um, they give us a lot of, of uh, they're very beautifully descriptive of somebody, as I said, who is not, who is not necessarily trying to run away from it all. She's, a, she's an abbess. She's, she's running a nunnery. And she's, as I said, she's productive. She grows things. She writes. She's, she's essentially, um, she, she's the physician of the, of the, of the nunnery. And, and, and yet you have these beautiful ideas of something, of the yearning for something more. Let's go, as, I, as you know, because of my linguistic background, I always have to take you through definitions and etymologies. So if you look at mysticism in the dictionary, you'll see one of the definitions is becoming one with a greater force, the gods or God. And yet, without contradicting itself, mysticism can also refer to an altered state of consciousness. And I like the word ecstasy, a sense of ecstasy, because ek, uh, in Greek means to go out of something like exodus, and stasis is a, a state of being, of being, like stade is to stand. So it's it's out of your stance, out of your normal place. You're displaced, and it often includes the goal of achieving of achieving deeper insights and enlightenment. And I and I wrote again into what? What kind of enlightenment do we want? And I love the Greek the Greek definition from the Greek. Uh, sorry, I was being too pretentious here. Neo. Uh, M M I O Neo, I conceal, uh, and uh, the word mystikos itself refers to an, an initiate. And if I say that word, it basically means an initiate is somebody who has been accepted into into uh, into some kind of I don't want to say the word cult because it is now it's now a loaded word. Ex uh, accepted in some kind of sect into which they have they are accepted as having also attained a higher state of being. 
So that's so that's the word. There's where that mysticism says it all. If you just examine the word, and thus uh, we see mystis and mystii were used in ancient Greek texts. My first my first knowledge and first encounter before he was even interested in Kabbalah or in Sufism was actually in the ancient Greek rites. And so even the ancient Greeks weren't happy with Zeus and as I said in Hera and Athena, they had their own household gods they they worshipped. And they weren't happy with that either. They created mystery religions. And they needed it. And in fact, uh, actually, they, uh, there, was, there was almost a contrast. The Greeks were perhaps the most honest about it because they had this contrast between the Apollo, wait, if you go into Nietzsche, but Nietzsche is actually correct, this, uh, the, the sense of Apollo, the, the, the cerebral way of, of viewing things, and Dionysus, the passion, the ecstasy. And in some ways, the, the Greeks had, had religious festivals to both. So, uh, and actually, actually, that's what theater was. A, the, uh, a play was basically a chazan coming and, and seeing the words, uh, divine words. And then they would have, and then eventually they, they introduced another chazan who answered him. That first other chazan's name was Thespis, which is where you get the word thespian from. So, they, uh, they, uh, so in other words, even, even theater began as a mystical rite, as a way of, of giving voice to religion. <clears throat> so, and Euripides, in, in, a, in, a law, in a recently discovered ma uh, manuscript, uh, what would you call it, a papyrus scrap, describes uh, an initiate, a mystic, who devotes himself to an ascetic lifestyle. And he renounces sexual relations, avoids contact with the, with, the, with the dead, and he becomes known as a Bacchus, a Bacchus, which is where you get, obviously, the Bacchic rites. So, mysticism, thus, refers to religious secrets gleaned by the wise and initiated, and also kind of secret from others even others that practice the same religion. And in the Old and New Testament, it often the word mystic or mysticism came to indicate a hidden purpose. So this could be the hidden purpose of humans, of course. But usually by reading the text over and over again, you are, you are said to find the inner, the hidden will of God. And the fact that it's so successful on us as humans, and, and I don't want to assume, but assuming that many of us are Jews here, the, the fact that, not, that nobody can read a, the, the, um, the weekly portion of the Torah without just reading it straight and, and already automatically assuming there's deeper meanings in the words, that shows how, how, how successful this way of thinking has been has worked on us. We don't even, it's, we're even taught almost not to accept it at face value. So in other words, we've been, we're all initiates without even realizing it. And so I asked, that's basically the answer here. What is the religion between, this is the question is answered, basically. What is the relation between religion as we know it, the difference, and mysticism? So I'm going to go back now to my past sessions. And those of you that don't, were not with me, don't worry. But basically, uh, and I tried to write it out a little bit, the, uh, when we're talking about the Middle Ages in, in, the, in the Islamic world, you have, unlike the Christian world, which was already steeped in, in ancient Christian traditions that, that already had been canonized and ritualized, you have a brand new religion called Islam that's uh, basically started in 610 AD <clears throat> that's basically grown up with, it was born with uh, Hellenistic thinking and born with, uh, with an incredible influence of, of Jewish thinking and Christianity. So, and, and it was a fresh, open religion. And if you read the Quran and, you, and you're, uh, I guess I would say, not a believer, you're just going to see an incredibly huge influence of of both the uh, the many many of the Jewish scriptures, not just the Torah, uh, including Talmud, Mishnah, things that just creep in there, as well as the New Testament, and and op fully open to dialogue. So uh, so when so anybody who was anybody who lived in this environment along with the Muslims and wanted to basically go, let's say go to medical school, go to madrasa, you can you're not allowed to become a doctor if, unless you're a, an expert in the Quran and the Hadith. You're expected to talk about these things, to discuss them. So whether or not the Jews rejected this way of thinking, they were discussing it and they knew about it. And Rambam grew up with this way of thinking. Uh, so you're going to. So in other words, even if philosophy was rejected by Jews as a valid tool to understand our Judaism, they were forced to consider the theological underpinnings of their faith in in new ways. So uh, so yeah so. Let's, so yeah, I'll skip over this one, so I just said, basically. So what were the factors crucial for this kind of interaction to occur? Why did it happen? Well, why did it happen here and not in the Christian world? First of all, Jews and Muslims were able to visit each other, their homes. 
they can go to public bathhouses together. The common language was Arabic. Everyone spoke it. So they needed it for economy. And the first, and the first Rambam wrote in Arabic, not in Hebrew. Uh, many of the Sadia, many uh, Ibn Gvirol, all these, all these great philosophers and thinkers wrote in Arabic. And so it was, this was very good for social interaction, as well as easily soaking up religious or mystical ideas. And, and, and I believe, and I argue that the Jews and Muslims created something new together. That the Jews first gave it to the Muslims, and, and, and this, this concept of a, human, a human's relationship to God, which was a very Jewish way of thinking, uh, this, this idea of the, the Moses relationship, the idea that one has a one-on-one relationship, one discusses, one talks, one argues. This was, the, this was a gift to the Muslims when they, when they invented it. And then the Islam said, oh, wait a minute, we like the Aristotelian way, or maybe we don't like the Aristotelian way, let's talk about it. And the Jews were exposed to that. And this conversation gave rise to the very, the very reason that we're having this conversation right now. <clears throat> and yet, can't, let's not get too uh, um, rosy-eyed about it. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the dimi, uh, dimi is a term I have not defined before. I don't believe uh, the dimi uh, refers to the fact that Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians, under the Islamic uh, regime, were, were allowed to exist. They were not, not allowed to be f uh, forcibly converted. They were allowed to <clears throat> be f uh, almost full members of, of society, but they were second-class citizens. They had to pay tax taxes to be allowed to live in, in this Islamic uh, world. And there were, uh, there were other limitations. They could rise almost to the top, but never quite to the top. And if there were periods of unhappiness or a ruler that was less uh, benevolent, they could also be subject to the occasional pogrom, Christians as well as Jews, but mostly Jews. <clears throat> and the idea, that, the idea that no matter what, the Jews always knew they were not in their own home, there was always this messianic thought, the, the concept of a Mashiach. A Mashiach will one day rescue us. And even in times when the Jews thought they had it the best, under the, uh, in, in, uh, under Ferdinand, before Ferdinand and Isabella in Andalusia, this was probably the time when the Jews were, uh, as a people, were at their flourishing, at their, at their best. And yet, in 1492, when Ferdinand and Isabella uh, expel, expelled them, there's the, uh, uh, this was a period of time of great uncertainty. And the Ottomans, when they welcomed the Jews, the Jews wrote in their text, several of the, of the great thinkers, that this is a step towards the Messiah. So in other words, anytime there was a, a period of upheaval in any of these, in any regime under which the Jews lived, there was always the idea that we need a savior. And so let's, let's, let's put those two together. You're allowed to have a mystical interpretation of divine texts. And... We have we were encouraging a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, with the one God, <clears throat> and we need a Messiah. It's kind of a potent mix I'm, I'm kind of uh, giving you here right now. So if we if we agree that the Jews and Judaism influenced Islam, and now Islam uh, also uh, influenced Judaism, let's look at how mysticism evolved in Islam. Just in a few, I, it's a very brief description. Please do not. Uh, like I, I urge you, if you find this interesting, to go deeper into it. But let's look at a few of these of the first few steps of how it happened. In the in the very beginning, you have Muhammad with his revelations, and the Quran says this is how you practice Islam. And in the very beginning, if you remember, if those of you that were with me, Muhammad was very much uh, an emancipator in every sense of the word. <clears throat> he uh, he his wife proposed marriage to him and put him into business. Uh, the first copy of the Quran that was ever uh, written was entrusted to a woman. The women uh, led led troops in the battles over the future of Islam, uh, Aisha. Uh, so that we had a very we had the and the leaders both both Muhammad, Abu Bakr, and Ali actually clean clean their own homes along with their servants. They they adhere to a different way of of a more modest way of uh, lifestyle. And yet when you had the the uh, other other leaders that came along, that were more, that actually wanted the vestiges of wealth, the vestiges of power. Uh, I'm going to get political on you. The, uh, the Netanyahu's versus the, uh, versus the Ben Gurions. Um, then you, uh, um, I can't help it, I'm in Israel, I'm sorry. But uh, then you, uh, uh, then, then suddenly you get a yearning back to what they believed was a better, was a better, more simple, more honest past. And the first things you see among, among the, uh, among the uh, Muslims is an appearance of ascetics. 
people who go back to a simpler lifestyle, who uh, simpler clothing, uh, that, that shun wealth and shun the, uh, the appearances, uh, you know, too, too much of a good thing. Uh, here's, I just found out, I just shows, shows a picture of six Sufi masters sitting together. And so I read here Sufism. Uh, by the way, the Sufi, I'll, I'll get into this later again, but the word Suf probably comes from wool, wool and garments that the, uh, the practitioners wore as a symbol of their humility. And, uh, and the reason why they wore this was as a, um, it, it was, uh, they borrowed it basically from the, from the monks, the monks who did something similar. But unlike, unlike the monks who practiced their ascetic lifestyles in solitude, the Sufis uh, valued community and, and liked being communities and liked people and wanted this interaction and wanted to grow. So, uh, these, so I wrote these early ascetics rejected earthly pleasures and they became known as, uh, uh, I'll see, yeah, as people who were always crying because the world was just a, a, a cottage or a hut of, 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 yeah, of sorrow. And so they, and also they, they, they daven, they prayed the entire night, the night long. This is what they, this is the first, the first times we started hearing of another kind of movement happening. And then the second stage after the asceticism, you get this development of a of classical mysticism that says, I want love. I want something divine. I want something that's that's going to give me the feeling of, of this concept that I that I call love, the way I love my child, the way I love my wife. And uh, and what Rumi says, the, the moment I heard my first love story, probably a real love story, I started looking for you, for Allah, for something greater. And one of the things that mystics seem to have in common, by the way, I'll just digress for a brief moment. I've noticed this in all my studies, and whether it goes to Buddhism, it goes into uh, Sufism, <clears throat> into the into into uh, Jewish mystics. They all start talking about something greater, and almost lose sight of the words of like Muhammad or Moses or people that like figureheads that we consider to be important. That almost disappears, and they almost all start talking about the same concept of a divine love. And I find that I find that kind of that arrival at the similar place kind of uh, intriguing. And around 740. Uh, common Era, a woman, and, and, I, and I want you to all remember her name. I want you to know Hildegard by the time you're finished, and I want you to know who Rabia of Basra is. Rabia in 740 uh, became known as a great teacher. People came from far and wide to hear her talking, hear her speak, and she, uh, and she said, I want a love that's unselfish, a love that has no, uh, that doesn't, that we're in which I'm not, I don't care about threats of hell. And I don't want to do it because I, I want to go to heaven. I want good rewards. I want to love for love itself. And this is the other step of the other, the other side of, of, of being an ascetic in which, in which you shun everything. The other side now is suddenly saying, I want love. I want this something. I want something. I want, act, I want to be active. I want to live in this. And her, her, uh, her quote that I chose for you is, Oh Allah, or Oh Lord, if I worship you because of the fear of hell, then burn me in hell. If I worship you because I want paradise, then exclude me from paradise. But if I worship you for only for you, then don't deny me your, your beauty, your eternal beauty. Let me be part of this. And Rabia was the first, I wrote the first, I guess I would write the first um, Muslim perhaps that we know of, to start preaching the idea of, of great, of agape, of great love, of ishkir ahiki. And, and she's considered to be uh, the, the most important of the, this is an awkward sentence I tried to phrase, I was trying to say someone who rejects motive in, what, in the terms of why you should worship. And this motive piety that rejects everything but says, I want the feeling. And this feeling starts like this, just the idea of, of love. But eventually it goes into, into rhythm, into music, into, into, uh, even into intoxicants. Whatever will give you the state of feeling of love became part of that. So, uh, and these types of mystical trends began to grow uh, everywhere in the Islamic world. Um, and again, I've spoken a lot about the Jewish, the Jewish uh, Islamic conversation, but that's why I started with Hildegrad. I wanted you to be where the Christians also played a big role in it. Arabia wasn't just Jews, and it wasn't just uh, non-Jews. It wasn't just pagans. It was also a lot of Christians. And, and these early Christians, their Christianity resembled Judaism too. So it's very much more than it does now. So you have this really crazy soup. And uh, so beginning with Rabia and continuing for decades later in the Islamic world, these kinds of mystical trends grow everywhere in the Islamic world. And it's not yet shunned by experts, by clerics, by imams. Eventually it becomes, they, they start to realize they're losing power. 
that's why uh, that's why many um, rabbis of different sects don't like mysticism. They don't like Kabbalah, and that's why uh, and that's why many Christians will reject certain types of uh, of mystical Christian trends. It's just uh, I mean uh, priests. It's a it's an, so Islam caught up got it caught on rather late the fact that this can be dangerous. So in the very beginning, you great you get great mystics who are also great who are also considered to be divine leaders in terms of their knowledge of uh, of hadith of juris of Islamic jurisdiction of Sharia. So uh, so and this continued for for centuries. So Islam, whether they like it or not, this is part of who they are. Something else I want to mention is that Sufi does not belong to Shiite or Sunni or Alawi or any type of uh, branch of Islam. It's its own concept. It's practiced by every sect, and it's it's just it's seen as a tool. It gives you words, ideas, techniques that's uh, supposed to allow your soul to interact with with your religion, kind of like an, as I said, I guess an intermediary perhaps. It's not it's not as a um, yeah I think that's really what I want to say. It's it's uh, in modern times people will uh, will make fun of it um, the way they sometimes make fun of uh, people who are trying to embrace Buddhism if they're not Buddhist if they're not uh, and by religion. If they try and embrace Sufism and they're not, they're not, they're not Muslim, um, and it's and I've, I've I've heard people really sneer uh, look uh, at people who are trying, but I think it's actually a very useful, interesting technique to look at and examine for its own in its own sake. Let's take a here. Why is that not so I wrote three, there's different types of schools that develop. The rise and spread of different orders of mystics. For some reason, uh, Cheryl, I don't have my watch here, my clock. I gotta get, I gotta keep myself on time here. You're doing well. It's uh, half past and okay. you're doing well and it's fascinating. Just keep going. <laughs> okay, one second. So, uh, One of the concepts that I, I uh, that that's that that also came in rather late, a couple of decades in, that built on the teachings of Rabbi of Basra, they said, aside from divine love, we also need to have kind of a faith in something. It's one thing to 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 want to be part of this greater love, but what about trust? There's love and then there's trust, and tawakul, which is like the idea of of absolute faith, absolute trust. This is this became a new element of myst of mysticism that started becoming part of all of the Islamic trends. So, uh, and this became a central concept of of Sufism. And in the eight uh, hundreds, this fellow by the name of Al, Al Muhasbi. Oh, here by the way, I show you the Christian uh, habit that gave rise to the uh, Sufi habit. And uh, he advocated uh, Al Muhas. Abu Khasbi advocated uh, learning self-control over all bodily needs. In many ways, he's going back to the ascetic way. And, uh, and this was the first establishment of a, of, a, of a uniform that everybody had to wear. And so he believed, for the first time, really, you get the sense that, that we have to purge our souls, kind of the way the Christians do in the, when, they, when they say they have to uh, be penitent, to prepare it for companionship with God. So this is, uh, and then shortly after, why is my phone, why is this not changing? Here? There we go. So he, uh, he stressed reason. And by the way, isn't this interesting? So, so it's, mysticism is not only about, about divine love. It's not only about moving outside of your body, ecstasy. It's also about reason. And he said, he said you have to anticipate, you have to have self-examination as well. So it's not enough to just try and, and nudge yourself out of your state. Also look at yourself. Examine why you do things. And this was a very, if you examine Abu Khasbi's um, uh, writings, which I would urge you to do if you find this interesting, it's like reading psychological textbooks. It really gets into the psyche on every single level. And and this and this constant why why do I do this why am I jealous why do I have hate why do I have ego he doesn't use the word, he doesn't use the word ego of course but uh, and uh, and he's uh, he's not against the other the other the other aspects but he says those are, these are all tools and in the Egyptian school of Sufism you start getting the idea of uh, of nature and of uh, ma'arifia 
looking looking inside of you and uh and the way the way you react not just to god but to things that you find beautiful in nature and he starts writing hymns and poetry and he praises nature and these poems start becoming part of of moving your soul into another plane and now you get the idea of poetry and music as a as a as also going back to the hildegrad model also these also the 800s by the way and then you have finally this fellow by the name of Abu Yazid, uh, the name is Abistami actually. Here's a, uh, well, I didn't give credit for this one, I have to put it in later. Uh, he, uh, he taught this doctrine of fana, the idea that you have to be so absorbed in the divine that you die in order to become one with Allah. So in other words, you, the, the final stage of divine love and becoming with one is death. And uh, <laughs> this is, I thought this is, for those of you that know, that know some Hebrew or Yiddish, What's, what do we say when you when you get drunk in, in Yiddish? Anybody know? Let's see if you can say the word shikr. So you have the word sukur, which is intoxicated. It's, an, it's a cognate. So you have, uh, so he believed, so he was given to these ecstatic utterances that were basically, uh, that were seen as almost an intoxicated person. And he was, uh, so in other words, now you have the idea, again, something that we thought came much later of speaking in tongues. You utter things, you just, whatever comes out of your mouth, as garbled as it is, becomes part of your passionate experience with the divine. And so in the, in the 10th century, the orthodoxy, by that I mean those that just believe a strict interpretation of the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sharia, started becoming more and more suspicious of these people and their ideas, and their idea that they were preaching something different than, than what was actually, than what they believe should actually be spelled out uh in their doctrines and so writers of uh you get sufi writers that actually have to start defending themselves for the first time and this is when you get the first textbooks explaining their philosophies and their way of thinking and their and their practices of islam and so you start seeing these textbooks appearing in all schools of islamic law and theology in other words so that's why we say that that sufism belongs or is rejected by all forms of islam everywhere and I thought perhaps it'd be fun to end with a very simple definition of Sufism, which is uh, an Islamic belief and practice in which Muslims try to find the truth, the truth of divine love and knowledge through a direct personal experience of God. And again, this is, um, this is something that goes all the way back to the very beginning of, uh, of the first conversations that we see both with Jews and with Muslims. The idea that, that and it's the very, beginning, the very beginnings of Islam as well, that one can have a direct conversation with God and does not need an intermediary. You don't need, you do not need anybody other than yourself. So, uh, so this is, so Sufism is perhaps a way, a means of helping people attain that. And then uh, I said, I, I thought, I'm going to give you a treat now. There's nobody better to introduce you to this concept than my favorite poet, Rumi. And Rumi in the 13th century created this, this crazy spinning dance Tell me if you've heard of this before, the whirling dervishes. And so basically by spinning madly with the music, you're giving expression and you are gain, you're putting yourself, again, ex stasis, out of standing, you're dancing now, uh, into the state of, uh, of oneness with something else. And so, and he also was just, uh, Rumi was, by the way, a very famous uh, um, master of, uh, of Sharia, of, of, of law. He was, uh, he was a renowned um, expert on Hadith and, and, uh, and Quran, and he was considered a scholar by everybody. But he was also a very deep mystic. And I wanted to introduce you to one of my favorite poems of his, which I think explains Sufism the best. I'm, I'm really excited to share this with you. Here, uh, what's the brief, I gave you a brief, room, uh, brief bio. Uh, born in 1207 to uh, native uh, Farsi-speaking parents in uh, Tajikistan. He, his poems were written in every language you can imagine, in Arabic, Persian, Turkish. He wrote them, he wrote them uh, in all his tongues as a first language. Uh, as, as basically, he wrote these beautiful poems. And, you can, and if you try and, tra if you try and uh, translate them, you will notice that they're beautifully, the rhythm and the beauty of it is different and yet somehow the same in these different languages. I mean, there's, I, I, I urge you to find, I'm gonna read you one poem that I know you're gonna like if you haven't heard of it before. But after that, I, know, I hope you're going to look it up on your own as well, or maybe Sherelle will provide you with some more. One moment. Here is something called the Fleet, the Reed Flute Song. And uh, I wish I could find you a better reader than me, but I'll do my best. 
uh, whereas I hope I have the translator written here. I want to give her credit because I thought she did a beautiful job. Here it is, translated by Fatima uh, Kershavaros. So listen. First of all, I, I, these pictures I chose for you myself. So I wanted to find you a, a reed bed to make you understand what's a bed of reeds. There are, there, it's this, they grow together uh, almost as one unit. They all look the same and, and waved and, and they're, they're very beautiful and lush. And if you ever have the experience of cutting a reed, they're hollow inside. And if you, uh, if you slant, if you cut a reed down diagonally, you also create a pen. A so they're, they're, they're very beautiful. And, and I, I've always loved reeds. And also, of course, if you puncture hole, punch holes in them and you put them to your lips, what do you have? What do you do? You create a flute. So here is, uh, here is the, the reed flute song by Bumi. Listen to the story told by the reed of being separated. Since I was cut from the reed bed, I have made this crying sound. Anyone apart from someone he loves understands what I say. Anyone pulled from a source longest to go back. At any gathering, I am there, mingling in the laughing and grieving, a friend to each, but few will hear the secrets hidden within the notes. No ears for that. Body flowing out of spirit, spirit up from body, no concealing that mixing. But it's not given us to see the soul. The reed flute is fire, not wind. Be that empty. Hear the love fire tangled in the reed notes as bewilderment melts into wine. The reed is a friend to all who want the fabric torn and drawn away. The reed is hurt and cure combining. Int intimacy and longing for intimacy, one song. A disastrous surrender and a fine love together. The one who secretly hears this is senseless. A tongue has one customer, the ear. A sugarcane flute has such effect because it was able to make sugar in the reed bed. The sound it makes is for everyone. Days full of wanting, let them go by without worrying that they do. Stay where you are inside such a pure hollow note. Every thirst gets satisfied except that of the fish, of these fish, the mystics, who swim a vast ocean of grace, still somehow longing for it. No one lives in that without being nourished every day. But if someone doesn't want to hear the song of the reed flute, it's best to cut conversation short, say goodbye, and leave. So that's Rumi. And uh, and if you if you if you uh, if you hear if you hear little notes, no pun intended, of Plato in there, there it's the uh, this cave. There's no surprising, you know, if you. Uh, every every thirst gets satisfied except the, that of these fish, the mystics. They swim a vast ocean of grace and yet somehow long for it. The uh, the idea is is that is that you have to you have to you've you've left you've left you've left your reed you've left your bed, and you're and you're and you're mournfully playing to go back but go back to what? Anyway, that's that's I wanted you to share that with you. And my next question is, what does that have to do with Jewish mysticism? Uh, remember, while this was going on, there was constant interaction with the Jewish population. And if you go back to my lectures from a few past, maybe, the Jews in Babylon, uh, I guess Iraq, Iran, these areas, lived at a time when Islamic scholars became masters of science, Arabic science, medicine, philosophy. And as we discussed today also, texts from the Greek world were translated, studied, philosophical methods were applied, and this activity spread to the Muslim West. And, and what I'm trying to say again, even though I said it a few minutes ago, Jews engage in this activity of this philosophical uh, and uh, discussions and translations. And it led to our first systematic Jewish theology and an exposure to this mysticism we're talking about. So of course, the, both faiths uh, share these common sources and they share this collection of stories. But there was also, and I don't think I brought up this point before, there was fewer theological problems than with Jews and Christians or mus Muslims and Christians. Muslims didn't see Jews as as prophet killers, they don't say you killed Muhammad. In fact, they they love the Jews prophets. They love the Moses, Aaron, David. They consider them all prophets, and they were decried. Sorry, I missed it either. They were decried as Christ killers by the Christians in Europe. And Jews and Muslims until today insist on pure monotheism. And both Jews and Muslims are very uncomfortable with the Trinity in Christianity. 
Jews and Muslims are allowed to pray in synagogues and, and mosques and vice versa. They're not allowed to pray in churches. So it's a, there's, a, there's a shared commonality here. So, uh, so we have, uh, we spoke earlier, uh, again, those of you that weren't here, you can look up the lectures, about the translation movement. And, they, and translating biblical books from Hebrew was a shared project by both uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews alike. And Saidiya Hagaon, also active in the 800s, wrote only in Arabic. And, and Sadia, by the way, is who is, of course, influential with, on Rambam as well, his first work, The Book of Beliefs and Opinions, is really the first uh, attempt to integrate this Jewish theology with components of ancient Greek philosophy, which the Muslims were already doing, and with Islam. So uh, Sadia and Rambam and Ibn Virol, I can mention several others, they started putting this Jewish traditions and scriptures under scrutiny using these examples that they've seen from the Islamic scholars. It's something new. And again, I want you to, uh, I, I'm going to keep saying this because I don't think people ever really truly understand that, that we, are, we have these discussions because of this. We always think about ourselves as Jews, that we are Western. We never understand that we got our Greek knowledge from another route as well without even realizing it. That it comes to us via Islam, via Rambam, and we have, we're, we're, we're double whammy in very different ways. And it's kind of fascinating. So uh, for Jews and Muslims, religious law is paramount. In other words, we're, we're an ethno-religion as Jews. We, we, we need this religious law. It's who we are. And uh, study of the Quran, uh, Hadith, Kalam, which is, the, which is basically the, the deeper study of the text, jurisprudence, the fiqh, and it dominated Islamic life. And just and, uh, in a way, it doesn't do it for Christians, by the way, as it does for Jews who study Torah, Mishnah, Talmud, theology, mysticism, religious law. I hope you're getting my, my point. And then I get to my, lesson, my next point. Uh, Shirel, give me time. Sam? Uh, quarter to quarter two. It's okay, okay. if you go a few minutes overboard, don't worry. Okay, great. So I'm talking next about leaders and messiahs. So I was saying, why were messiahs wanted? Why were messiahs needed? And uh, <clears throat> we're going into a new idea, a new concept. Something called millenarianism. Try and say that 10 times. Uh, it's the belief uh, in, our, and again, once again, most of us are subject to this. <laughs> I think it's psychological. It's a psychological, um, I think, uh, inheritance that we all, we, all, we all have as a result of being born in this world. The idea that everything's going to be changed. There's a coming religious, social, political group movement. And the idea there's an apocalypse coming and the world's going to change. So it's a, uh, and from the beginning of the 17th century, there was an idea that the Messiah was going to come. This, uh, this is very popular among the Christians as well. This uh, mil uh, millenarian idea. It included the idea that Jews are going to be redeemed. By the way, it leads right to the Balfour Declaration. It, like it's, it, it leads to the, to the Baptists uh, still in America. This is not something that's from a long time ago. It's something that still drives us. Uh, the idea that the, the return to the land of Israel was, and with their own sovereignty was going to bring about the apocalypse. Christians believed it was going to be 1666. And this is when you have uh, this concept widespread in England. And Menashe ben Israel, uh, again, someone please look up later, and it wrote to Oliver Cromwell and said, you have to readmit the Jews who have been exiled into England, saying the opinions of many Christians and, and of mine as well, that the restoring time of our nation, of the Jewish people into their native country is very near at hand. If you take the Jews back into England, you're, you're basically hastening the, the the Mashiach, uh, who's going to come, the final apocalypse that's going to see the great victory of the Christians, which is, of course, the cynical aspect of, of us embracing this idea. So, uh, uh, so this is, I, I found this Menashe ben Israel. He was a very close friend of Rembrandt's, by the way. Rembrandt actually painted this picture of him. And uh, uh, whenever you see pictures of Rembrandt uh, dealing with, with both about uh, where he draws Jews or Jewesses, and he writes in Hebrew, it was always with his consultation with Menashe ben Israel, so of uh, his friend who lived just down the street from him. So uh, he was uh, he was he was the first printer of Hebrew books. He was considered a reliable source by Christians on Jewish customs, law, and history. And uh, again, this application of uh, an ap apocalyptic timetable um, occurs in many cultures. By the way, uh, anybody know uh, the name of this final battle? What it's called? Anybody see it? I want to see if it's, I'm going to read, read your lips. Can you see it? Armageddon? 
You ever heard that term? So I, I, I lived for many years near Armageddon because uh, in, uh, uh, in the Jezreel Valley, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a kibbutz called Kibbutz Megiddo. And it's, it's on a mountain. And it's, it's actually a very small hill, but it's called a mountain. It's called Har Megiddo. Har Megiddo gives you Armageddon, just for fun. You should know that. So, uh, so the, uh, so this, this concept holds the second coming is the very near, and there's going to be a kingdom of God on earth. And for Jews and for everybody else, what crisis is going on to create the need for a savior? So for us Jews in the mid 17th century, I always have a hard time saying this word, the, the Chmielitsky massacres, uh, which was a bunch of, uh, uh pogroms in Eastern Europe, uh, these pogroms gave uh, basically rise to uh, uh, a, se a series of writings known as the Kabbalah, uh, which uh, which basically stirred hopes of uh, a Messiah who's going to come to deliver us and actually bring about this, this new change. And Rabbi Yitzhak Luria in the 16th century believed that all of these miseries were happening on purpose. But these miseries are happening to, create, to basically spread divine sparks all over the material world. And these divine sparks were somehow going to transform and help uh, and help bring about this coming of a Messiah. So in other words, the as the misery was happening, they were waiting. They said, this is great, great stuff, Mashiach, please come. This is That's the philosophy behind it. So Luria saw this, uh, this, this, and by the way, the same, the same excuse was used during the Holocaust by some, by some uh, rabbis as well, trying to say, or, this is a, it's a divine plan to, to, to strategically place the world's hidden sparks. And this meant that Israel would soon be restored. So here's, here are these, uh, I want to show you that during this time period, you have, you have different messiahs who are coming along and, and their spheres of influence. So in Hebrew down here, can you see it says Shabtai Tzvi. And up here it says Yaakov Frank, we're talking about him. And here we have Shlomo Molko. So we have these suddenly at this time period you get these people that are that are basically using maybe they believe so i don't want to, yeah they, they're using all of this idea of of both mysticism the idea that uh there's going to be a an apoc apocalyptic change and that we are the prophesized messiahs who are coming and i wanted to talk to you about two or three of these people really briefly one of them was shaptai tzvi have you heard of him before Shabtai Tzvi was born in 1665. He was a Romaniat Jew. In, uh, Romaniat Jews were prevalent in Greece. He was born in the area uh, called Smyrna to Romaniat parents. And he was known as Nilui, as a brilliant thinker at a very young age. But he was especially drawn to the mysticism of the Kabbalah. If you know your Kabbalah, you know mysticism, you know the divine personification of, of God has a female spirit called the Shekhinah. And uh, so he uh, he became... He became famous first for going into ecstasy and, and talking about his love for this divine spirit for the Shekhinah. His, his, uh, and he was, so he, as he would go into ecstasy, go into trances, go speak in tongues. And then on the other side, he had these incredibly clear and intellectual scholarly abilities to debate, explain, expound. And he gained adherence everywhere. And more than that, he convinced some fundamental, uh, the, the, some of the greatest rabbis of his ages, he can, such as Nathan of Gaza, he convinced them that he was the real thing, and they they supported him. So uh, I was just here at the synagogue, by the way, a few weeks ago. Shabtai Tzvi's uh, synagogue in Smyrna. Um, uh, it's just it's right by the main shul in Izmir. I had 42 students, by the way, that daven in a shul next to here. That was a shul that had been daven in for 350 years, and it was the first. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm happy about this. It was the first egalitarian uh, uh, practice that ever happened over 350 years. So we had girls coming up doing aliyahs. It was really beautiful. And the shamish, who was an old-fashioned uh, 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 Jewish guy, had never seen anything like that before. Um, the, the, our guy thought he'd be horribly offended. He was, was crying. He was so emotional to see Jewish life back there again. It was really beautiful. Uh, so anyhow, the, uh, the word shabtai uh, comes from the word sabbatai, actually, is, uh, is the planet Saturn. And, uh, and that's, that, that'll actually figure, I won't talk about it today, but it figures a lot into, into his mystical texts. I don't want to get into it. So uh, locally, Shabtai Tzvi's behavior of, 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 um, got crazier in the minds of his own rabbi, and he declared a cherem against him. A cherem means you're excommunicated. Cherem in, 
in, in Arabic is the inverted word haram, which means forbidden. And a sultan's harem is a place where uh, women are forbidden to everyone else but the sultan. So this idea of harem excommunication is also, it's a cognate. So he, uh, he, had, he was excommunicated, but despite that, he began to traveling to various Jew cities, visiting the Jewish communities with his incredible charisma, and he attracted followers, repelled rabbis, and eventually he was expelled from Salonika, which is a, uh, another amazing place in Greece, by his rabbis because he staged a wedding with himself as the groom and he married a Torah. So uh, he was expelled from there as well. Where does he flee to? He goes to Israel and goes to Gaza, to Gaza. And he meets this, this uh, scholar called Nathan of Gaza, who himself declared Shabtai Tzvi to be the Mashiach. Why would he do that? Shabtai, like Nathan, Nathan of Gaza is the real thing. He's a, we use this text still today to understand, to, to gain deeper understanding of, of, naughty, of naughty problematic aspects of the texts. What does he say? Nathan of Gaza says, when I was 20, I studied the Zohar. I studied the Uranic teachings. And he says, I and I, I was trying to get closer uh, to God on my own. And I did that same year, energized by the visions of the angels and blessed souls. I was engaged in a prolonged fast during the week before the, fi the Feast of Purim. I locked myself in a room in holiness and purity. And as I tearfully recited the penitent prayers of the morning service, the men Modani, the spirit came over me. My hair stood on end and my knees shook. And I beheld the Merkava, the divine chariot. And I heard, I was vouchsafed true prophecy, uh, beginning with the words, thus speaks the Lord. And then I recognized with utmost clarity, my heart perceived to whom my prophecy was directed. And then I saw that he, Shabtai Tzvi, was a true Mashiach. And indeed, the angel that revealed himself to me in my waking vision was a genuine one. And he revealed awesome mysteries to me. So uh, this is Nathan of Gaza. He has, now, now Shabtai Tzvi has his support. He's gaining more and more followers. And, and there's Haggadahs, textbooks all over Europe, all over the Arab world that are starting to actually have his picture in the back, Shabtai Tzvi the Mashiach. So it's, uh, he's, he, has a huge, he has a huge movement following. He actually ends up marrying Sarah of Ashkenaz, a former prostitute. And uh, he, uh, he's, he's actually just, he's, it seems like there's no end. He's, going, he's, he's getting masses and masses of followers and they're dancing in ecstasy when he comes to their cities. And so he, he, uh, he rides around on horseback in a majestic state. Uh, the messianic news spread like wildfire to other communities in Palestine. First reports about Shabtai Tzvi reached Europe in uh, October 1665. Deeply involved with legendary material, they're making up myths and stories in Italy, in Holland, Germany, and Poland. And uh, so he begins to gain adherence in Venice, Laverno, Amsterdam. Leading rabbis and Jewish leaders are getting caught up in this frenzy. So some more people that were most so sober, some of the Jewish community leaders said, this could be a problem because the Ottomans might not like this so much. This guy's stirring up a lot of... Uh, a lot of excitement here. So uh, the Turkish government, the Ottomans, decided to arrest him when Shabtai Tzvi was actually going from Izmir to the Dardanelles. And he was, he was arrested by two ships and brought before the Grand Vizier, Ahmed uh, Korpurulu. And the Grand Vizier liked him too. So instead of, instead of uh, killing him or executing him, he puts him in, a, in this really kind of fancy prison. And in this prison, his followers start coming doing pilgrimages to his prison. He has sacrifices there, a uh, sacrifice of lamb. His prison is called uh, Migdal Oz, the temper of strength. Imagine a prisoner inside of his prison is dressed in regal garb. The whole complex is filled with royal bed linen, pillows, feather beds, and gifts. He sat in his palace accompanied by his wife, Sarah, who had joined him, while Jewish scholars pilgrimaged from everywhere to hear him teach Kabbalah. This is by the uh, I took this picture too, and it's still called the House of the Talmud, where he was. The party ended. <laughs> On September 15, 1666, look at the year, interesting, no? When Shabtai Tzvi was brought before Sultan Mehmed IV and given the choice, convert or be executed. I mean, be, yeah, convert or be executed. What does he do? He converts. He puts a turban on his head and he's given the honorary title keeper of the gates and he's given a fund of 150 piastres a day. So the majority, by this is an actual look at the Shabtai Tzvi and throne. This is from a Tikkun in Amsterdam, the same year, 1666. So most of the most of the Jewish world were shocked and disillusioned. They tore out all the evidence. 
They ripped out his pages talking about him. Documents were destroyed. But uh, probably won't surprise you is there were still he still had followers, and these followers still exist until today. The Donne, uh, and they have uh, they true they converted to Islam, but they don't marry outside of the Donne community. So they have uh, and they have very their customs. They're they they live mostly in Turkey now. It's another story, but they used to live in Greece. But under the great the great transfer, the Donne were no longer considered Jews. They got transferred to the Muslims. That's a different story. But uh, anyway, uh, so what happens next? These, uh, by the way, he has like, I think I visited two of his three by accident, ended up in two or three of his places where they say his grave is. Um, this is a Don May uh, synagogue, by the way. Uh, sorry, we'll go back one. And uh, one of his followers, uh, Jacob Frank in 1751, uh, said, I am his successor, successor on earth. And Frank, created a new type of Judaism that we now call Frankism, which takes aspects of Christianity into Judaism. And this is one of the consequences of the Messianic movement of Shabbat Tzvi. I don't want to be controversial, by the way, but the other aspect of, of, of being the speaker for what this mysticism means also led to a lot of the Hasidic movements as well. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm going to be very careful here, but I'll stop there. We can have a conversation when, we come, when I come to Orange County about what I think about that. But... Uh, Let's look at the next one. Uh, in uh, 1756, they, the local Jewish authorities said, Jacob's getting way too Christian in his way of teaching. And they gave him a cherem. And he says, oh, yeah? And he converts to Catholicism, along with 3,000 followers. So uh, his daughter, uh, uh, Eve Frank, Eva Frank, who was born Rachel Frank, uh, was raised in this family committed to Shepard Svi. And Eva was baptized with the, with, along with her family. And Jacob, now that, he's, now that he says I'm Christian, starts to preach his religion even more, even more strongly and more boldly. But then Christian, the Christian scholars, the Christian uh, theologists don't like him and the authorities, so they arrest him. And they say he didn't really convert, it's false conversion. They noted that he and his followers continued to worship uh, a divine presence and they didn't marry outside of the community. So Jacob was also imprisoned in a monastery in actually Shestachova, where he also visited, got visitors to admirers, and he developed his own ideas about mysticism, redemption, and a lot about the feminine sexual power, kind of like Shabbat Tzvi. And so what happens? Uh, he, uh, he actually names, uh, when his wife dies, Jacob decides that, that this divine feminine decree has been passed on to his daughter, and his daughter is actually the Messiah, Eva. And Eva Frank becomes... Uh, is declared the Mashiach, the reincarnation of Virgin Mary and the Shekhinah, the divine presence on earth. And many people follow her. And this, she becomes known as the Lady or the Virgin. And her pictures are distributed among Frankists. This is a very big thing, by the way. It's not, it's not a small little movement. It's, it's, uh, she's carried, pictures of her are carried by Christian worshippers. Although you see, uh, she looks a bit more uh, like scandalous with a decoltage. And Jacob establishes her as a central figure of worship and encourages her to hear people's confessions and give punishments for sins. And when Jacob dies in 1791, Eva moves to Offenbach with her brothers, and she continues her role as the Mashi as the Mashiach. And when she died in 1816, the Christian Frankists, the ones who were actually baptized, became kind of regular assimilated. And Jewish followers uh, continued their own kind of davening services following the Frankish ways. And in the early 19th century, the Frankists started being seen as kind of like the Freemasons, and sort of a, again, secular, secret, ritual-based society. And this, I'm, I'm going to finish this with a really interesting note. So there was, there were still pockets of support for Jacob and Eva Frank, and over a century after her death. Who's this? Anybody know? This is uh, Brandeis. His family were Frankists, and they actually had pictures of uh, of Eva Frank in in their in their uh, in their uh, uh, in their tropes. He was a full Jew, but they still had this Frankish aspect in their history as well. I just want to show you how prevalent this was. It's something that we don't speak about, but it's very much part of our story. And this again, this attraction, that, this deep attraction that we have in the search that continues in all humans for something deeper, for something more, it doesn't end. And I wanted to, and I thought it'd be kind of fun on the, to end on the last aspect. Anybody heard of the cure of the Shakers? 
So the Shakers uh, were founded by Mother Anne, Anne Lee, in, actually in England. And she believed she, was, she embodied all the perfection of God in the female form. And she was the female counterpart to Jesus. And her followers were persecuted and they came to America where they founded the uh, various um, communities all over, uh, all over the, uh, the States. And uh, they invented, um, they, were, they, they believed in creating heaven on earth. So we go back to mysticism. They believe you create heaven on earth. How do you create heaven on earth? Through hard work, dedication. And uh, they, they would buy slaves and they would free them. They believe that men and women and all humans were equal. They worshipped, uh, they, they believed men and women were equal. And they worshipped on each side. They were celibate. So if you were a husband and wife, you came, you were celibate afterwards. And they would, uh, they would kind of daven like in the, the early reform way of, the, of davening where the males would stand on one side sit on, and the females sit on the other. Why were they known as shakers? Because while they were praying, they were going to ecstatic sta states of shaking their bodies. They kind of, so it's, uh, so I find, uh, and what else did they invent? They invented the straw boom, packaged seeds, um, circular saw. They were, they were very, and their furniture is still famous until today. My dad was a world expert on the shakers, by the way. When I was younger, he used to take me and he'd, he'd research them. And I'd live with him uh, while he researched them over the summer, uh, uh, months at a time. I think the last one died about 10 years ago. And he used to make a joke that he spent the better years of his life uh, um, chasing after 90 year old virgins, but because they're all women at the end. But uh, uh, it was there were wonderful people. And I hope that we had a, a fun journey into the world of mysticism together and the Shiaks and the Sayas. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, David. We do have a few questions. So even though we're a little over time, I do want to ask them if you can sure. stop share for now. It's also, I feel like for we need share? another, yeah, just so we can see you fully. And also okay. feels like we might need another, um, oh, what's this? That was my conclusion, but it's okay. I, I think I said it. Okay. Uh, when, where do I stop my share though? Here, stop share. Okay. Hello, everybody. <laughs> So thank you so much. Um, maybe, I mean, this is a question that might, maybe possibly should be another full session, but maybe if you can touch on key themes that you would say appear in both Sufism and Kabbalah that you identify as a combination. I'll just mention, for instance, with the phrase you started with today with to break your heart time and time again until it right. opens. Someone even in the chat wrote something we were talking about also before, the famous saying of the Rabbi Mikot, Rabbi Mikotsk, uh, saying, en davar shalem yoter milev shavur. There's nothing more whole or complete than a broken heart. So if you can touch on some key themes that you see as uh, connected or influenced between the two. I, um, I think that... Uh... I think that I touched on one of the scholars that believe that that you need deep, deep study and knowledge. It's not enough just to believe, to, to have this ecstatic sense of the divine. You need a sense of both. And that is, that is peculiar, I think, to, to, the, to the Jewish and the, um, and the Islamic way of, of mysticism. And it's a, uh, in many other faiths that I've studied, because I, I love mysticism, it kind of says one or the other. Uh, although the Shakers also do get into that as well. Uh, I'll, can I get back to you on that one? That's actually a full lecture. But that's, I, I, like the, yes. I like the question. Yeah. I, I, think, I think we might have to have a, a full lecture. I'll also say, um, uh, yeah, I have here a comment. First of all, I'm opening the, the chat to everyone. And Great. Phil uh, did write it's an, that it feels like it's a tip of an iceberg. And I totally uh, agree. It makes kind of uh, really wanting to, to study um, uh, these things. Uh, can you say maybe a few words about... Uh, uh, the Rambam's son and his like turn to Sufism. I, this is again another full lecture, but right. just yeah. It's uh, I mean, I don't, I don't really because it's a um, like if you actually look into it more deeply, it's a uh, it wasn't so. Rambam himself was against Sufism. He uh, he was against uh, a lot of this, um, and but Sadia wasn't. So uh, there's a um. Maybe you can see in a Sunday rebelling against his dad, but uh, but the um, in terms of the uh, of like how much deep, what, what would you like me to actually say about that? Because there's not there's a his his he was a very he was a great scholar in Sufism, mm -hmm. but um, but in turn I would say he brought his father's teacher teachings into it. He made an interesting combination of both, but so I don't, yeah. I don't have, 
I think also actually most of the questions I have are very large scale one, and this kind of makes me think that we do need some maybe opportunity to study with you possibly parallel texts from. Uh, I would love to. I, the, I actually have them with me, but I would love so, to do that. So yeah. I think uh, this is this is good to know. And at this point, thank you for taking us through kind of the historic influences of these two traditions. I think it's really- I, I hope it wasn't too shallow. I was really trying to just touch on it and, and do light touches on each one, but uh, far, it was fun. Far from that. Uh, uh, far from that, I think, and just opening a huge gate into uh, things that I think people want to study more. And once again, uh, the follow-up, email for your session is probably the most fascinating one to work on. Um, so you'll all receive that. And I'll also make sure to include links to previous lectures yes. so that you can refresh uh, your memory on that. Um, we have David coming back uh, for a program, one program in May, a uh, full four part series uh, in June. And then I think it's a 10 day or two week stay in Orange County in July. So uh, it's lovely to have you. Um, and you. it's nice to know that we can take some of these questions and turn them into sessions that you will yeah. be giving. So, uh, I actually, I actually find the Zoom, the, Zoom, the Zoom is actually very frustrating because uh, these questions are, are, are wonderful. I, I actually want to sit down and, and really get into it now and then we're just going to end. So, uh, but I, I appreciate them. If you want to email me, I'm also happy to get into, into a deeper conversation via email and, so and go back and forth on that. We'll include David's email in the follow-up email. And also, I really do think that we have from these questions, literally a basis for at least three more sessions. And we will, we do have the possibility to do that. So uh, this is not me just saying words, it will actually happen. Um, yeah, so thank you. Uh, well, thank you all very much for your interest. And uh, until next time. Yeah, okay. until Bye. next time. Bye. Bye.